shear stresses in beams is one of the vital topics in strength of materials. So let us see. So let us see shear stresses in beams of uniform cross section. When a beam is in pure bending, the only stress resultants are the bending moments and the only stresses that are getting produced in the beam are the normal stresses acting on the cross sections. However, most beams are subjected to loads that produce both bending moments and shear forces and so we call it as non-uniform bending. In these cases, both normal and shear stresses are developed in the beam. The normal stresses are calculated from the bending formula or flexure formula that is m by i equal to sigma by y equal to e by r provided the beam is constructed of a linearly elastic material. Now let us see vertical and horizontal shear stresses. Consider a beam of rectangular cross section of width b and height h. So here it is the width b of the beam and height here is h subjected to a shear force v. It is reasonable to assume that the shear stresses tau acting on the cross section are parallel to the shear force that is parallel to the vertical sides of the cross section. It is also reasonable to assume that the shear stresses are uniformly distributed across the width of the beam although they may vary over the height. Using these two assumptions we can determine the intensity of the shear stress at any point on the cross section. So this is a cross section of width b and height h. Now isolate a small element mn of the beam. So I have taken this small element mn of the beam as shown in figure 1b by cutting between two adjacent cross sections and between two horizontal planes. According to our assumptions the shear stresses tau acting on the front face of this element are vertical and uniformly distributed from one side of the beam to the other. Shear stresses acting on one side of an element are accompanied by shear stresses of equal magnitude acting on perpendicular faces of the element that is from figure B and C. There is the shear stresses acting on one face of the element is always accompanied by shear stresses which are acting on the face perpendicular to this face. So it is evident from this figure B or you can see figure C that is called as principle of complementary shear stress because again this tau if this tau is creating clockwise moment this shear stresses these two tau will create anticlockwise moment will again cancel with each other. Even if we take the summation of forces this tau gets cancelled with this tau and this tau gets cancelled with this tau. Therefore again the element is in equilibrium. So there are horizontal shear stresses acting between horizontal layers of the beam as well as vertical shear stresses acting on the cross sections. At any point in the beam these complementary shear stresses are equal in magnitude as already I have explained. Now going further. Equality of the horizontal and vertical shear stresses acting on an element leads to an important conclusion regarding the shear stresses at the top and bottom of the beam. That is this is the top of the beam and this is the bottom of the beam. If you imagine that the element Mn that is this element in figure 1a is isolated at either the top or the bottom the horizontal shear stresses must vanish because there are no stresses on the outer surface of the beam is very simple to understand. If I consider this element at the extreme top or at the extreme bottom then we know that since the surfaces are free this surface is free as well as this surface is free therefore the shear stresses rather the horizontal shear stresses at top and bottom surfaces they must vanish because there are no stresses on the outer surfaces of the beam. The vertical shear stresses must also vanish at those locations that is very very important equation tau equal to 0 that is shear stress is 0 where y is plus or minus h by 2. So from here from here to here it is plus h by 2 whereas from here to here it is minus h by 2. So at upper extreme edge and the lower extreme edge the shear stress is 0. Now the existence of horizontal shear stresses in a beam can also be demonstrated by a simple experiment. So place two identical rectangular beams on simple supports and load them by a force P. So this figure 2 a clearly shows that we have placed two beams on each other which are simply supported and then I have applied a load P. 
if friction between the beam is small the beams will bend independently like which is shown in this figure 2b each beam will be in compression above its own neutral axis and in tension below its neutral axis for example if i take this upper beam and this is a neutral axis then above the neutral axis there will be compression below the neutral axis there will be tension similarly if i take this the beam below then again this is a neutral axis and the stresses above the neutral axis will be compressive below the stresses will be tensile so the bottom surface of the upper beam will try to slide with respect to the top surface of the lower beam now moving further suppose that the two beams are glued along the contact surface so that they become a single solid beam that means i will glue them i will stick them together at this contact surface when this beam is loaded again like this horizontal shear stresses must develop along the glued surface to prevent the sliding that means between these two contact surfaces or between these two beams this is the contact surface and therefore if it is glued together rigidly then there must be horizontal shear stresses which should get developed at this contact surface so that the upper beam and lower beam don't slide past each other due to the presence of these shear stresses the single solid beam is much stiffer and stronger than the two separate beams now let us see the derivation of shear formula let us derive the shear stresses tau in a rectangular beam however instead of evaluating the vertical shear stresses acting on a cross section it is always easier to evaluate the horizontal shear stresses acting between the layers of the beam of course the vertical shear stresses have the same magnitudes as the horizontal shear stresses now let us consider a beam in no non uniform bending that means there is a presence of shear stress as well as bending moment as shown in figure 3a consider two adjacent cross sections mn and m1 n1 at a distance dx apart so i have considered one section here there is mn and the other section m1 n1 at a distance of dx and please keep in mind i am not drawing the cross section of the beam here i am this drawing is along the length of the beam consider the element m m1 n1 n so this is m m1 n1 n so i am considering this element bending moment and shear force acting on the left hand face of this element are denoted by m and v so at the face mn the bending moment acting is m and the shear force is v as both the bending moment and shear force may cha change as we move from this face towards this face there is a distance dx the corresponding quantities on the right hand side faces are therefore m plus dm that is bending moment and v plus dv where dm and dv are the incremental changes in bending moment and shear force respectively moving further due to the presence of bending moment and shear force the element as shown in figure 3a is subjected to normal and shear stresses on both the cross sectional faces however only the normal stresses are needed in the derivation as i mean referring to figure 3b on cross sections mn and m1 n1 the normal stresses are respectively sigma 1 equal to my by i and sigma 2 is m plus dm into i by i because we know from the famous flexure formula from pure bending theory that sigma by y equal to m by i therefore on this face the sigma 1 equal to m into y divided by i and on this face sigma 2 is m plus dm into y by i where y is the distance from the neutral axis and i is the moment of inertia of the cross section area about the neutral axis where we give moment of inertia in terms of mm raised to 4 moving further isolate a sub element m m1 p1 p that is this m m1 p1 p this element i am again isolating by passing a horizontal plane p p1 through element m m1 n1 n that means i have considered this element and then i have again consider one sub element this one m m1 p1 p by passing one horizontal plane p p1 plane p p1 is at distance y1 from the neutral surface of the beam 
this sub element is shown clearly in figure number 3c that is this figure its top face is part of upper surface of the beam and thus it is free from the stresses its bottom face which is parallel to the neutral surface that is this face which is parallel to the, this neutral surface and at a distance of y1 is acted upon by horizontal shear stresses tau existing at this level in the beam its cross section faces mp and m1 p1 are acted upon by the bending stresses sigma 1 and sigma 2 respectively produced by the bending moments vertical shear stresses also act on the cross sectional faces however these stresses do not affect the equilibrium of the sub element in the horizontal direction that is in the x direction and therefore they are not shown in figure 3c if the beam at cross section mn is having a bending moment which is equal to bending moment at a cross section m1 n1 that means bending moment at this cross section is same as bending moment here that is shown in figure 3b that is if the beam is in pure bending then normal stresses sigma 1 acting over the side mp must be equal to normal stress sigma 2 acting over the side m1 p1 of the sub element that means the stress acting on this side mp must be called the stress acting on this side m1 p1 if the part is subjected to pure bending so the sub element will be in equilibrium under action of the normal stresses alone that is sigma 1 and sigma 2 so the shear stresses tau acting on the bottom face pp1 will automatically vanish it's obvious because a beam in pure bending has no shear force and hence it has no shear stresses already we know it from theory of pure bending now moving further if the bending moments vary along the x axis that is if it is a case of non uniform bending we can determine the shear stress tau acting on the bottom face of the sub element that is this one as shown in figure 3c by considering the equilibrium of the sub element in the x direction we begin by identifying an element of area da in the cross section at distance y from the neutral axis as shown in figure 3d so now here i am considering a cross section of the beam now it is not along the length of the beam it is is a cross section of the beam so i am considering element da at a distance of y from the neutral axis force acting on this element is sigma into da we know that force is stress into area therefore on this elemental area da the stress is sigma the longitudinal stress or the bending stress and therefore the force will be obviously sigma into da in which sigma is normal stress obtained from the flexure formula or bending formula that is sigma by y equal to e by r equal to m by i if the element of area is located on the left hand face mp that means if this element is considered at the left face mp along the length of the beam or of the sub element where the bending moment is m the force in the element is sigma 1 da is m by m by i into y da we know from the famous flexure formula that my by i da we can say we can equate it to sigma 1 into da because we know that sigma 1 upon y equal to m by i therefore sigma 1 into da is m y by i into da summing these elements of force over the area of face mp of the sub element it gives the total horizontal force f1 acting on that face that means on this face mp the total horizontal force i will get therefore i can say f1 f1 acting on this face will be integration of sigma 1 da that is integration of my by i da is a very important note this integration is performed over the area of the shaded part of the cross section that is this part such that it is from y equal to y1 the limits to y equal to h by 2 so from y equal to y1 from here to y equal to h by 2 so this area m m1 p1 p is the area under consideration therefore the force f1 is shown in figure 4 
is force F1 on a partial free body diagram of the sub element. Vertical forces have been already omitted since they are not needed in analysis. Total force F2 acting on the right hand face M1 P1 that is on this of the sub element is F2. Similarly, is integration of sigma to dA that is integration of M plus dM because we know that bending moment on this face is M plus dM y upon i into dA. Knowing the forces F1 and F2, we can now determine the horizontal force F3 acting on the bottom face of the sub element that means this force F3 acting at the bottom face of the sub element. Since the sub element is in equilibrium, we can sum forces in the x direction and therefore we can obtain a very important equation that is F3 equal to F2 minus F1. So let me repeat again this F3 we can say F2 minus F1. Therefore we can say F3 equal to this F2 minus this F1. Therefore when I do solve it becomes integration of dmy by i dA. Therefore F3 becomes dm by i integration of y dA because we know that for a given beam dm will be constant moment of inertia will be constant so I can take it out of integration and therefore inside integration it becomes y dA. If the shear stresses tau are uniformly distributed across the width b of the beam the force F3 equal to tau b dx. Let me once again repeat if the shear stresses tau are uniformly distributed across the width b of the beam the force F3 equal to stress into area. So we know that stress is a shear stress you can say Newton per mm square width b is in mm and dx is also in mm therefore force is this tau in Newton per mm square into this area mm square. Here b dx is nothing but area of the bottom face of the sub element. So I can say that tau equal to F3 divided by b dx and again we know F3 equal to dm by i integration of y dA. So here I have repeated dm by i integration of y dA. Therefore when I substitute the value of F3 from here into this equation tau equation tau becomes dm by dx into bracket 1 by ib integration of y dA. We already know from shear force and bending moment concept that dm by dx equal to shear force v at any section or in other words the rate of change of bending moment at any section is equal to shear force at that section or in other words the slope of bending moment diagram dm by dx is shear force v and therefore this equation can be rewritten as tau equal to instead of dm by dx is the shear force v divided by i b integration of y dA. Now the integral in this equation is evaluated over the shaded part of the cross section as shown in figure D as already explained. Thus the integral is the first moment of the shaded area with respect to the neutral axis that is this z axis. That means if we go back this integral y dA is nothing but the first moment of the shaded area with respect to the neutral axis. In other words, the integral is the first moment of the cross-sectional area above the level at which the shear stress tau is being considered. This first moment is usually denoted by the symbol capital Q. And therefore, I can say that Q equal to integration of y dA. And therefore, tau equal to Vq divided by Ib. This equation is known as the shear formula. It can be used to determine the shear stress tau at any point in the cross section of a rectangular beam. And then important note that for a specific cross section we know that shear force is V, we know moment of inertia is I and we know that width is B and all these are constants and therefore the first moment Q and hence the shear stress tau varies with the distance Y1 from the neutral axis. So, for this explanation I have taken the reference of mechanics of materials by James M. Gear and Barry J. G. the 7th edition. Thank you very much.